Agnès Varda on stage. Thank you, Florence. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Good evening, Agnès. There is so much to... to, to yeah. <laughs> Thank you. There will be no branding here, except the Varda brand. We have so much to discuss. We have 60 plus years of filmmaking, of your filmmaking. We have your 14 years as a vis visual artist to discuss. And we have so little time. As a way in, to discussing your, all this extraordinary work, I want to tell everyone about a beautiful moment that I had in September of 2000 when I was fortunate enough to meet you for the first time. I was interviewing you. You were in New York to discuss, to, pr to promote the Galeners and I. And we had a good time. I we remember, because I know I'm giving interviews like always, but sometimes it is a meeting. And I remember vividly we were in a place, and we stayed for a while, not always speaking. We enjoyed drinking a tea or something. I, when they told me, would you, uh, would you like to meet Melissa? I, said, oh, I remember meeting her. So time is, is erased. I mean, we met two days ago about the <laughs> cleaners. I'm very touched that you remember this because I was incredibly nervous, and you put me at ease immediately. And uh, yeah, it was a wonderful two-hour conversation. and. With the Gleaners and I, which was 2000, our conversation, we're going to skip a lot over the decades and discussing Agnes as a filmmaker, Agnes as a visual artist. But from the Gleaners and I, which was made in 2000, you later did an installation, Patatopia. It's, it's a good term. Um, as you see the costume, I don't wear it every day, you know, only on Sunday, <laughs> only on Sunday. So this is true. Since we met in the Gleaners, this is the piece, as a filmmaker, which made me switch to the installation. So we will show you, if you wish. Yeah. Because it became, you'll see, an installation that uh, I was invited by Obris at the Venice film, no, Venice Art Biennale. So it was my first time I dared, because I loved so much the idea of installation. I've been following passage from modern art to contemporary art. And I was seeing people making installations. Would I dare, would I dare? And I've been invited. So you have here a little piece of Le Glaner yeah. and my first installation. Could we see a clip C, please? You know which one? Mm. Uh, it was true that <coughs> he gave me much joy to have three screens. Because I've been doing films and I love what it is. Have people in a room watching one screen and sharing the same moments of you know violence or calm. But what I love in the installation and the three screens, I, everybody comes and stays or not stay and, and builds the way of vision, build what he sees, what he chooses, what she chooses. So. I have a lot of satisfaction satisfaction with making what they call installations. Mm -hmm. But I still love cinema. <laughs> well, and you just recently completed a film, isn't that correct? Yes, I've been co-writing and co-directing a documentary with the artist J.R. that I'm sure you know, more or less, here in New York. He's well known. And we did a real documentary, going the country with his magic truck and meeting people and listening to them. And since we have different ways of putting light on the people, uh, we put light the way I listen to them, we make them speak, and then he does his huge images. And we felt that we were together wishing to give voice and to give room for people who are unknown and somewhere in the country, in villages. In France, the name is 
visage, village, and here it will be faces, places. But it won't open before, I don't know what, November maybe, so be, don't be, don't be curieux, wait. <laughs> so, but you see, there is something sometimes I show in these meetings. It's because uh, I don't have a way of introducing myself and my family. But once I was in San Francisco, somebody told me about a man called Varda. And Tom Lady took me there. So I made it right away a short about that meeting. And if you agree that we see that. Yeah, the, the film that Agnes is discussing is a lovely short film from 1967, is that the correct year, called Uncle Yanko. And I believe it was w one of the first films that you made in the first of two extended stays that you had in California. You're right. <laughs> no, I'm not making jokes, but it's just true that I didn't intend to d make a film, but I met that man. I was so excited. I asked Bob Greensfeller, can you give me a camera, some 35 millimeter shot, let's do and, and we went directly to do the film two days after, because I was leaving for France. But I wanted to show how excited I was, how, how happy I was. So I show you a little piece because, you know, you can say I met my uncle or I discovered I had an uncle. But I wanted to the audience to share how it was exciting for me. It's a short piece, but yeah, d'accord, parfait. Could you please show clip A? It's because you know this is from Uncle Yanko. It's the way we tell reality which makes sense. Because you can say something, just might make the fact, but I like to share the feeling. You, you said something very, very wonderful to me when we met earlier backstage. You said that a large part of, of filmmaking of your filmmaking project is the question, how do we invent the facts? How do, do we reinvent, uh, make it uh, interesting and share, you know, I'm sure you understood how happy I was, you know? It's not enough to say that I met the man, but he was wonderful. And then there is a short about that, 20 minutes, but this is the part in which it's clear that it was a good surprise. <laughs> and sometimes, there are different kind of surprise. Remember, well, something maybe we could show. You know, I was doing a film about more or less my life, my work. If you have heard of it, it's called The Beaches of Agnes. So a film I made. And part of it was to try to find memories in Belgium, memories in the different places where I lived. And so uh, somebody, you know, would see. I thought I should go to the house where I was raised, in Brussels. So somebody gave me the address, you will see the story. But something happened that you will see. I had in mind to go and see if I remember my sister, my little sister, my two brothers, you know, something going back to my youth. But it turned differently. Tu veux montrer ça? This is a clip, clip F. Clip F, please. And this is from your wonderful cinema memoir, The Beaches of Agnes, from 2008. Has somebody seen The, the Beaches of Agnes? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> maybe, maybe it bores you to see it again. But <laughs> it makes a point. It makes a point that when you love, love to do documentaries, you know, the syndrome of being a documentarist comes out. You'll see if we have the, the piece. Do we have clip F, please? Oh, here we go. I think this clip that we just saw really exemplifies one of the more extraordinary traits of your of your documentary filmmaking, which is you're always so endlessly curious and you're absolutely willing to follow strange paths, take odd detours, follow digressions, and that you see that quite a lot in a wonderful TV series that you did called Anya Svarta from here to there, which was shown at the Film Society, I believe, three years ago. And I remember it's a 
it, if I'm remembering correctly, it's a, it's a five episode series. Each installment is about 45 minutes and you travel all around the world and your, your travels are occasioned by retrospectives of your films or installations. And you're just so excited to meet new people and there's a, a wonderful moment where I believe you're in Stockholm and you're talking to a journalist who's lost all of her hair. And then you interview her and she explains what happened. In that case, uh, I made the, the interview on her, yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. But it was interesting because she really lost her hair. Suddenly, it's something called something. I don't remember the name. I think but it's sometimes with an emotion, yeah. she became bold. Uh, so I was so surprised. I asked her about it. Uh, it was nice, and we had a conversation. You know, it's interesting to meet people that I don't know what I call real people, not that the other one are fake, but not looking for casting, not looking for famous people, even though I met some beautiful artists like Boltanski or Solage, but I don't treat them better than or differently than people I meet in the street or in markets or fishermen or people. This is true that real people inspire me very much. And sometimes I like to give a shape to that, you know, because if I can speak about the widows. Pardon? Can I, do you allow me to speak about the widows? Oh, of course, of course. Because, you know, I've seen documentaries about people out of work, uh, farmer, the problem, the migrant, many, many subjects are treated because there are beautiful documentaries all over the world. But I never saw anything about the widows. It's a category of people that seem to be boring or not interesting. And I was in the island of Noirmoutier, where I've been living with Jacques Demy, and I was a widow. And I noticed that in that island, there are more widows than any other place, because a lot of men die in the sea, fishermen or in the harbor or something. So I decided to make a documentary about that. Is a fighter, maybe? <laughs> so I did something, and you will see, it's again the, the dispositive, what is it, set up? Mm -hmm. I, I decide to find a shape for that. Is, is there a fight? <laughs> Try to avoid that. So, so you'll see, it's very well explained. The way I treated the situation, obviously in a real installation, you have the, the screen and you have 14 chairs and you have to choose a chair. So I filmed the installation to give you an idea. And if we could show that yeah. excerpt. Could you see. show clip E, please? And I like to see those because people know my film, but they know very, very rarely they have the opportunity to see the installation. Those are the widows of Noir Moutier. <laughs> you see, that was something in which I mixed because I, I don't want to have, like I've been a photographer in a drawer, filmmaker 35, then a video. No, this is the same, in the same piece, we have the 35 millimeter film, well done by Ricotti. But then all these pieces that I did, I met these women alone, or sometimes with one help for the sound, and they trusted me, they say, I was living in the same island, they had known Jack, they knew I was widow, and they spoke to me so nicely. They offered me very sincere thoughts that maybe they didn't say so often, you know. And when I did that, and then everybody had to take the earphone, so it was a person-to-person -person conversation. Didn't look like a documentary in which everybody speaks in front of everybody. So it became very intimate. And as you can imagine, when we go in another country, there is no way to put subtitles because it would ruin the subject. So what happened, and I was very impressed, we went to China and they wanted to show this. So we had to dub the world voices. So can you imagine in China, a widow of Noir Moutier starting to say, you know, my husband died and died, we reach you to the country. And in Chinese, with Chinese audiences, men and women, with their eyes very touched, and they were very impressed. And I was more than everybody impressed that 
cinema, art is a language that crosses the borders. You know, it, you, you, I do that in China, and they understand what I'm speaking about because they understand they have mother or grandmother. Maybe they were not enough taking attention to them. You know, very often people say to you, "Oh my God, I didn't listen to my mother. Now she's dead." And and some people got the feeling that. Some children went and they say, I have to s speak to my grandmother. I don't know her enough. It's something, it's like everybody reacts personally differently. And this, listening to one or two, you have to change chair and to get another earphone. It's, you know, I'm trying to work after cinema. What can I do? I'm trying to find a different way to address to people, different way of sharing experiences, another shape of cinema, art, whatever you call it. I think that with that very eloquent statement, this may be a wonderful time to take some questions from the audience. Yes. But Did you all hear the question? If I get bored about traditional cinema, yeah. but how could I get bored? I mean, cinema for me is an adventure, ex experiment. And I never repeated myself from one thing to another because if it makes sense for me is that can I look for something, not question of better, or, but can I find another way of communicate? Can I express what I feel like there is a piece in the, in the gallery, Blumenpool, which is the seaside. It's very simple. There is a photo of the sea. Then uh, the, the ship I in part. Then it becomes cinema. The end of the photo moves really like a film. Then you have sand. So it's three very simple elements. But people sit, and well, wherever they are in New York, at the floor of the gallery, suddenly they are at the seaside. I'm proposing a very strong evocation. You saw it? Yes. I, I, it's like being at the seaside. Uh, it's not a photo, it's not a film. It's something composed to make you feel that there are many ways of representing anything, a landscape and emotions. So how could I be bored? I have still a lot of ideas that I could maybe, if I, I, I stay just a little more, I could do other things. Yes. This gentleman's question was how much Agnès was influenced by the films of Jacques Demy, her husband, and conversely, how much was Jacques Demy influenced by Agnès? Well, we had the pleasure to live together and share, you know, the food, the bed, the children, but we didn't share the way of working because really, and I admire Jacques Demy's work, but it has nothing to do with my research. And I, I don't think I was being influenced by him because when he did Lola, you know, that was something, I love it, but I, I wouldn't do it, I don't know how to do it. And when I did Vagabond, I remember he loved the film and he said, well, I, w I wouldn't do that, going with a rebellious girl on the road, this is not my thing, you know. We, like the young girls of Fushford, that I, did, oh, I adore the film. It brings joy, intelligence, you know, this beautiful sister playing twins. I love the film, I can see every day, but I won't be able to do something like this. I don't think we influence. I was much more influenced by painting, painting, that I love painting since I was very young, and literature. Like my first film was influenced by Faulkner, Wild Palms. Things like this have been more important for me than cinema, because at 25 I had not seen more than five films or six. So when I meet his student now, being 22 or 23, and they have seen 100 films, and they know everything about cinema, I'm very admired, I say, oh my God, they know so much when I knew nothing, so uh, there is no, Jacques was seeing much more film when we met. It took me to, to movies to see films, you know, because uh, my, uh, my inspiration doesn't come from cinema, even though now I love it and I go to see many, and I admire many filmmakers, but it's, it's not, I, I don't feel we have been influencing each other, but maybe you see it is fine with you. I, I'm very eager to ask you a question about uh, one of my favorite films that you made during your second return to California, a beautiful film called Documentor, which you made in 1981, I believe. And 
you made it the same year as your documentary Murmurs. That's interesting because you spoke about the color. And I remember loving the Californian colors and filming all these murals, expressing the city, the sun, the extraverted way of... But then I made the second film that you speak about now, Documentaire, that in English we call it an emotion picture. Mm -hmm. And it's a shadow film. It's a shadow of the other film. It took us a lot of time to go on the side road that has no sun. We escaped the sun. We succeeded to make a film with sort of white light or dark, but there is no sun. I remember saying this is Hollywood with no fun, no sun, no pun. I remember <laughs> saying that. <laughs> but you see, uh, I love colors, but sometimes it's important to fight colors to express something. Yes, but when it makes sense, the black painters were not only, only in color, but in their expression, they were colorful, you know, and strong, and singing, and expressing their color, comment dire colère, la colère, uh, well, and their anger with songs and dances, and, and the other one who spoke about was Yonko. Yonko was a painter, he was doing for color, you know, when I did documentaire, I felt strongly that I, sh I should avoid color. It's a choice, it's an artistic choice. So I, I love color, but I also love escaping color. May, may I ask that, that you, you, you indulge just showing this, this wonderful clip from Documentor where we see it your... Shows it, I don't know. Yeah, no, we, we have a clip. It's just a very, it's 40 minute segment of, of Matthew. And it's about a child. And we know that, you can ask the, the, we know that children have emotion that we don't always understand. I love children, I had, I, have, I had two. But I know that the world of children is something that we try to understand, but it's not ours. We, we don't reach what they feel. And I remember, if it's the scene, yeah. I believe. Could you show clip J, please? J, c'est comme J. It's like John. J is in John, yeah. Uh, we have the problem with J and G with us. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. <laughs> but, but, but. <laughs> it's a scene, it doesn't matter. It's a scene in which they are looking for a pla place to rent. And I was impressed because all the places were say, no kids, no pets. So we found a place, they find a place where they can have a child. And they enter the place and they look around and she said, that will be ro your room. And she said, like mother said to children, you will be very happy, you will have your room. And the answer is, and if I'm not happy, what will you do? <laughs> and well, it's the end of a scene, but it's one of the points in which we believe that we are good in understanding, in listening to people, but we, other people are always other people than we are. So I think our understanding is limited especially with children. Oh, I've been working you know, with, with cleaners, with squatters, with people uh, no, in the street, in the road. And I try to listen, I try to understand, but they are different. I'm not sure I reach something in which they understand come, you know. You like to see the squatters thing? Oh, you yes, know, yes, yes, yes. Squatters, you know, because we speak about the migrant, and my God, this is an universal problem, terrible, and about the people having no roof. But sometimes they grab a roof, this is half broken, and they squat. But then nobody allows them to stay, so they're kicked out in a very violent way. And I thought, if you ask, can we ask, please? May we see clip D? Because what I thought when I did the, sh the is that they need a bed, so they need a mattress, they need heat, so I made a, a oven, they need food, and I, I got a... Like what a simple mattress means, you know, and all that image and documentary and inventing a shape helped me to think about them and not just being poor people, okay, poor people, I feel for them. I tried to make an image of that, constructing something with these objects, the mattress, the oven, the four, 
the chauffage, the heating thing, and, and the, the beans, you know, that they buy. When they can buy, they buy it. Can, and or they eat it cold, or they heat it, or they eat it old, or they heat it, I don't know how to say. But what I mean is that I'm trying to make understand that there may be, there may, may be a way to tell things. It's not a paper, it's not a reportage, I'm not a Madame uh, Charité, I don't know how you call that. I don't know. I try to, to, be, to do my work as filmmaker and videos and what can I express that can be shared. And I hope you will touch what they say, they are kicked out, you know. And, and I think it's interesting to know in a shape which is cinema or video. It's not just a report that could be in a magazine. Somebody said that my documentary starts where television stops. But it's not true, because I've seen incredibly good television reportage. Now it's getting more and more. So I just pick categories of people where there are no documentary, like the widows, you know, the mm -hmm. squatter. I had not seen that. But there are many other subjects that are well treated. And we need to share what, what, what people live, you know. We don't only have one life, so what we can learn from other people, from other lives, I think make us vaguely understand better the tragic and chaotic world where we are. Well, I think that's evident <coughs> in your very first film, La Pointe Côte, where there are two professional actors and then all the other characters are played by non-professionals, people who you met in set. Is it, was that the town where, where it was filmed? Where you spent your, your adolescence? Well, I spent, we were pushed by the war and the bombs, so we ended up in that city that mm. We didn't know. But you see, uh, what you said about. Qu'est-ce que tu as juste dit maintenant? C'est-à-dire que. Attends, I have to think it out. It's. Uh, we are not the witnesses, official witness of our time, but we are. Naturally, we are. And when I made the film about the rebellious girl that is called Vagabond, it was something new happening, because I've seen boys on the road, older men on the road, and suddenly young girls and women were. So I've been following the change of, of society, I would say. And on that thing, I took a girl, because it was the beginning of the rebellious girl on the road. I had not seen them before. So I tried to catch something happening, like I made a film about feminists called One Thinks the Other Doesn't, because we had been fighting like tiger to obtain birth control, which is like a big deal, you know, and the right of abortion. And I see that these fights that we did years ago, it's never, c'est jamais gagné, comme on dit. It, we never won, win. We have to go back, and the history does like this, and back, and this, and back. So I'm trying to be <coughs> like a leaf in the wind, you know, feet, feeling free and catching something on the way. Well, if I miss it. Let's take, uh, yes. Um. You're right, because I even remember taking picture with a camera, a box, with a something, and I had to put a veil and change the, comment dire, plaque, I don't know. We had to put the thing, close, uh, open and close. I mean, the 19th century technique that I used because I loved it. I think it was fun. I took a portrait of Brassai like this, you know. But what I'm saying is that I went with what, wa with, with what was happening. I remember for the Glennon and I, it was the first time I shot with a video camera and discovered it with joy because it's very interesting. But you see, I went back to 35 sometimes and I do video. I did the, the Cisola almost alone and sometimes I ask people to do so. It, it's just different ways that we can use it, different opportunities. You don't film the same way, you know. I could not have done the widows if I had needed a big camera and a crew. They would never have spoken. So they could speak to me because I came alone with a little camera. It looked like a photo, you know, camera. And it was so peaceful. I had a little tripod, but so peaceful that they felt they could speak. So we have to use the technology. 
to make sense about what we do. And the editing, now I cannot edit myself on these things. The timeline I cannot tell, but I do every decision about every shot, every cut, but I don't know. I knew how to do it before, you know, f with the magnetic tape, we had to glue and, uh, and cut and hang. But when it became digital editing, uh, I'm there every day, but I don't touch the thing, it's too complicated, I don't know how to do it. But um, editing is, is a mind problem, it's not a technical problem, like everything. One of, one of my favorite pieces in the, your exhibition at Blum and Poe is how you're using film as a very material quality and building those beautiful, well, they're maquettes, but those cinema shacks where you've taken leftover strips from your films, Les Creatures. You say leftover. No, it's the point is that, you know, we used to show films with 30 millimeters, 35 millimeter reels. And they were like seven or nine cans with reels and we will go in the booth, projection was showing the reel, and sometimes they have two to show the reel one, and then other machine the reel two. And the technology has changed so much that now old films are in DCP, which is a little cassette like this. Obviously, it's more interesting, it's less heavy, easy to send by mail. So something happened that we were surrounded by hundreds of, of reels of film. And because I have the idea of uh, comment dit récupération, recycling, I say, okay, what can we do with these reels? And I decided to build shacks. So I, the first one I did was in uh, Paris, at La Fondation Cartier. I, a film that had been flopped, by the way, Les Créatures, and I used one full print plus a little more. And somebody helped me, we made a house, a real shack. Old walls, old ceiling was made with the stock film. We made little frames, we, on les a rempli comment. We, there was a way to, <laughs> to use the frame and put the film. So you enter into shack. Has somebody seen one of those or not? Somebody saw it in Paris, yeah. You know, you can enter the shack, and if you look through, we were wise, we put the close up at the height of the eye, so they could see Catherine Deneuve and Michel Piccoli through the light, you know and then sit on the boxes that we made, like Soul, Tabouret, Soul. And I did another one in Los Angeles with a Cali Californian film called Lions, Love and Lies. We, we had prints that nobody wants to show, and I built another shack in the LACMA, a big shack. People enter, they would see the film through. It, it's interesting because it's a joke. I love shacks, like every children has Every child has done shack, you know, with paper, with sheets, with whatever. So I, I mean, old, old child making shacks with film and big shacks. I, I don't want to enter, you know, like a cat pat, comme on dit. I like to understanding and say, this is my house, you know. And so I, I'm joking and l enjoying what's happening in the change of, of technology because you can always create something out of it. And these shacks, well, you know, I love them, and I'm trying to do others. So I did miniature, I did mini shacks to, to give the idea to some mesen or sponsor to build the big shacks because it's you cannot make it for five dollars. But, but, but I have in mind to do with every of my film, abandoned prints to do shacks. And how many have you done so far? How many shacks? I did two big ones, and four miniature, hoping. Uh, and the, the, four, the four miniatures are all at, at Blum and Poe. Yeah, because like, somebody has seen Le Bonheur, Happiness. Remember the beginning, there were a lot of sunflowers. So the shack will be a greenhouse growing sunflowers. You know, we have to interpret it, whether the story is. Like, if somebody has seen La Pointe Courte, at the end there is a boat, uh, abandoned. And I, I made a board which we made with film. So it's, it's a way of developing imagination about what is left of the films, prints. We have boxes and boxes of print. And some companies, they just throw them away. I say, okay, wait, wait. We can recycle them, recycle them maybe, and have fun. Because the whole thing working has to be in relation 
with having fun to do it. Mm. It's, it's wonderful to make a film. It's wonderful to have people around, like a crew. They help with the image, the sound. They push you, they, they drive you, and, and the editor does, you know. I, I love that job because it's, you have to do it with other people, but you have in mind what you wish. It happens that it becomes what you wish. This is, sadly, this will have to be our last question. Yes. <clears throat> the question is, and please correct me if I've misstated it, is how being a woman has influenced your career as a filmmaker, and how do you fight for what is important to you? Well, the fight for women is the fight of a woman in society. But as filmmaker, my fight from the first film is to find a language to be radical about what has been told that we could do or should do. So I'm very proud to be a woman, and I, I fight for all other matters in which we have to fight. But I don't try to make a feminine cinema, but it's a cinema made by a woman. You know, I don't want to be twisted, but uh, I don't sit and say, can I make a woman film? I would bore me to tears, you know. <laughs> but I know that my mind is the one of a woman, and I've understood things related to the world the way it is, and it, ap it appears, you know, in the last film I just made with Jaya, we were in a harbor, where the dockers worker, is that the word? The dock workers. Yeah, they are very strong, they, they, it's like a mafia. They have a union, they are strong, they make strikes all the time. And I went to see them, and they are very nice people, and I say, where are your wives? <laughs> and they say, well, they are not allowed to come to the harbor place, I say, bring them. And so we brought the wife, we start to see them and speak with them, very interesting women, and they help us to use containers, is that the word? Huge pieces of container. Containers, yeah. And to make like a Lego work, we pile them up and did this huge portrait of the women, like totems, you know. So this is a, on the harbor in France, at least, where women are the heroes. Let's take an example. But JR was totally agreeing with me. so. Together we decided to make an uh, homage to them because they are not quoted as a big big thing in the harbor. And the husband, the worker, worker agree totally. And they say, well, it brings a little change of mentality. I mean, so it's interesting to work with people, not to tell them what they have to think or what they should do. Convince them to enter in the game and make the film with us and make the piece with us. And that's what I like is that we, we, know, we cannot change the world, we cannot change the people, but in some encounters, we can make that we share a project, and Jay is very good at that, you know, bringing them to, to do it with us. So it becomes our work, but with their collaboration, and that how we think you will see it when it comes out. We, you will love these huge women on containers. <laughs> okay, thank you for your attention. This has been a great pleasure and honor. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs>